What's going on, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the Muscle Memoirs podcast. Today, we have a phenomenal episode for you. Returning back for round two, Alan Flanagan. Alan, how's it going, my man? It's going well, Mike. Thanks for having me back. It's my pleasure. I, I'm really excited to get into our topic of discussion, which revolves around a recent publication of yours titled Chrononutrition from Molecular and Neuronal Mechanisms to Human Epidemiology in Timed Feeding Patterns. I love, I love this paper. Uh, I've probably read it about four times at this point. It's good I, to I, hear. I don't know about you, Alan, but personally, I have like a power rankings for research papers. And this is in my top three. It, it, it's up there with Chris Melby's review, uh, The Biological Drive for Weight Regain. When it comes to my hobby horses and the topics that I'm super interested in, in the realm of nutrition, this is fantastic. That's great. That's really good to hear. I will, uh, I'll tell my supervisor that tomorrow. <laughs> Excellent. He's, yeah. He's the last name on the paper. So yeah, it was, it was, it was really enjoyable writing. Um, uh, the other uh, names on the paper, David Bechtold at the university of Manchester um, does a huge amount of, of molecular uh, research and um, circadian rhythms in, in, and, and kind of brain neuronal circuitry as it relates to like appetite food seeking behavior and stuff like that and then Gerda Pott who's a nutritional epidemiologist and was at King's College London is now back in the Netherlands and then Jonathan Johnson who's who's my supervisor who um again background in a lot of circadian biology molecular work and then moved into more of the kind of nutrition chrono nutrition side of things um in 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 the last kind of maybe five or ten years so yeah it's, it's really enjoyable when you get to kind of take the lead on a on a paper like that with some pretty brilliant people yeah crow nutrition is just a, a fascinating topic and it it seems to be an emerging field right there it, it's growing in interest it, it's rapidly evolving and there are just there's so many components in it that are of interest right i mean we're going to be talking about meal frequency, the effect of energy distribution, whether it makes sense to consume, you know, more energy, certain macronutrients at certain parts of the day, as opposed to other. Uh, we're going to be talking about, you know, the influence on energy expenditure, uh, you know, the relationship between meal frequency and, and body weight regulation. It's just a lot of great stuff that I know the listeners are going to be uh, really intrigued and just happy to hear your thoughts on and to outline the literature on this topic. Before we get into all those things that I just mentioned, I think it would be worthwhile to kind of get everyone on the same page and start with a brief introduction on the circadian system or, or ultimately this governor that is going to be uh, determining the, the outcomes that we're going to be discussing today. So for the listeners, could you give us a little bit of background about what's going on there? Yeah, so, so basically every, pretty much every organism on, on the planet, um, including our good selves, has evolved a, a kind of intricate biological timekeeping system that primarily is orientated around the 24-hour rotation of the Earth. And with that 24 hour uh, rotation, we get a continual cycle of light and darkness and light and darkness. And depending on where you are in the world, that light and dark cycle can lengthen or shorten uh, depending on your, your, your latitude. And it can, um, you know, be, be something that uh, we, we adjust to uh, across different, different periods. So, um, the, 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 the main, I guess, the best analogy to think about the circadian system is, is as an orchestra. So the conductor of the orchestra is located in this kind of really densely um, packed uh, area of the brain, densely packed with brain cells. And it's really interesting because in humans, um, we have this dedicated pathway from our eyes that relays signals about light to this to the brain to this specialized region where the where the conductor is and that allows the internal system 
to get signals from the external environment that it's either daytime or it's nighttime. And we then have clocks, so to speak, that the best, again, the analogy downstream in different tissues like our heart, pretty much every tissue in the body, skeletal muscle, the liver, the pancreas, all have their own set of clocks in them. And those clocks can actually run independently. They can respond to things like uh, meal timing. They can respond to um, other factors like uh, exercise, for example, or different heat, cold exposure, all these different cues from the external environment that this system kind of incorporates in and then looks to synchronize. So like I said, although those clocks in say your heart and your liver and your pancreas and your skeletal muscle can all act on its own timing, the system works best when all of those, if we think of each of those organs as a different component of the orchestra, like you've got the violin, you've got the, the cello, you've got the clarinet, right? They can all play on their own time, but if they all play out of sync and just do their own thing, it sounds like shit. Right. So the conductor in the brain, this master clock, is then part of what then synchronizes the whole orchestra to play together. And when the orchestra is playing together, we call that circadian alignment. And that is where your biological timekeeping internally for factors like your even your sleep wake cycle or, you know, when you feel tired in the evening, when you when you naturally wake up in the morning. Um, but your body then anticipating things like, oh, this is the time of day when we're active. So we, we, we make these hormonal things happen. This is the time of day when we get nutrient intake. So we're, we're ready for this right now. Or this is the time of day when we're not expecting nutrient intake, like 2 a.m. on a night shift. And so if someone eating at that time, the whole system's going, what are you asking us to do? This is not part of the plan because everything is synchronized really tightly over the 24 hour day. So circadian misalignment happens when we start sending curveballs of, of time cues to the conductor. And we can do that by not getting enough natural light exposure during the day and then sitting in front of a 60 inch plasma in the evening with our iPhone six inches from our face in bed, like all of that light, your brain doesn't, you're, you might know it's 9 p.m. Your brain is just the master conductor is acting on signals. So we can throw off with our light timing. We can throw off with our dysregulated meal timing, erratic meal timing, um, uh, later energy distribution, we can throw off by, you know, not really kind of being active during the day and all this kind of stuff. And, and, and when we do that, well, then the orchestra starts playing out of sync and that's circadian misalignment. And although, uh, you know, we, we still have a lot of way to go in this field generally, not just with the nutrition side, but the wider chronobiology and, and health aspects, we, we've a lot of evidence from, from animal models there's a lot of mechanistic understanding of what we think might be going on. Um, but the human data is still coming through and emerging right now. But the hypothesis is certainly that this kind of circadian dysregulation, this, this orchestra completely out of sync and sending the orchestra the wrong music and time to play is something that adds up over time to adverse health outcomes for humans. And the best example that we have in humans to support that right now is the adverse effect of, of shift work and night shift work in particular over time, which we know has dramatically negative effects when, when shift work is, 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 is worked for, you know, for 10, 20 years. Um, and there can be really adverse effects for, for cardiovascular and metabolic health in, in, in particular. So that, that's the biggest clue that we have to date that yes, dysregulating this system continually is not a good idea. What is of interest now, and certainly for a lot of the nutrition research, what's of interest is, well, we know that's an extreme, night shift work is an extreme thing to ask the human body to do. What are the effects of 
kind of less severe, but more chronic disruption to this system. Social jet lag, for example, you, you, you sleep, you know, uh, you're, you're kind of working week sleep and you're, you're waking up to an alarm and you're absolutely knackered because you didn't go to bed you, you, or you went to bed late. Maybe you're just a, a late type and you go to bed late, but then you have to get up early. So your sleep is curtailed and then you get to the weekend and then, you know, you might go out, like not get home till 4 a.m. and all this kind of stuff. And so what, what's the effect of constantly changing the timing of the sheet music we're asking the orchestra to play over time? And that's, that's the question that we don't necessarily have an answer to right now. We have some cohort studies that would be suggestive of, of adverse effects. And we've some mechanisms that would, uh, from intervention studies in humans, that might give some biological plausibility as to why we see some of these kind of potential adverse effects over time. So, yeah, I hope that's I hope that's not too messy an explanation. <laughs> I thought that was perfect. It was a brilliant analogy to simplify this very complex system. As you outlined there, we have this master conductor, you know, the suprachiasmatic nucleus and the hypothalamus, and then we have all of these peripheral clocks. Mm -hmm. And this master clock is on this biological schedule. It has a set routine. It likes to operate in a specific way. Mm -hmm. Whereas these peripheral clocks, they can be influenced by all of these environmental cues to where they can become out of touch, desynchronized with the master clock. And, and that's where the, this ruckus, this awful noise, noise that the or, that the orchestra <laughs> plays uh that's where it starts to happen so i think this leads nicely into well what is the schedule that the master conductor would like to operate on like what is yeah. what is the tempo that it wants to set so yeah. here we could discuss the uh diurnal variation in the secretion of metabolic hormones, the ones that we're most interested in when it comes to nutrition and, and postprandial outcomes. So we're talking about things like insulin, uh, incretin hormones, ghrelin, cortisol, perhaps kind of summarize for the listeners here, the, the trends we see in the literature when it comes to the the diurnal variation and when when these hormones are in their uh, highest concentrations in, in yeah. the body. So the, the the master clock sets itself primarily on melatonin, and that is highly responsive to the light signals that we talked about. So when we are perceiving light or are exposed to natural daytime light, melatonin is suppressed. And, and the master clock would like, ideally, to have a situation, as we would have throughout evolution, right up until Thomas Edison dropped the light bulb on us, that when the sun goes down, we're entering into a phase where the light environment has changed fundamentally. Candlelight would not have the effect of suppressing because of the, the, the red... Um, kind of spectrum of color that we get from from candlelight from fire doesn't suppress melatonin doesn't have that effect on melatonin which probably makes sense from an evolutionary standpoint if we were sitting around campfires so melatonin elevates uh, the primary uh, light spectrum is blue light so it's basically the the color that you would see on a, on a clear blue sky day but in the evening, when the sun goes down, ideally, the conductor wants melatonin to then rise. And that would kind of ultimately shift us from the active waking uh, food foraging, food intake phase to rest, digest, no food intake, preparation for sleep. And then we would have our nocturnal fasting period. And I'll come back to this because there is a relationship between melatonin emerging in terms of underlying metabolic health. So, so the, the conductor of the orchestra sets itself according to melatonin and ideally wants that to fluctuate where it's low during the day when we're exposed to light, to light and then increases at night when we should hopefully be, be in a kind of like dimly lit or dark environment. And then the component parts of the orchestra, well, they all have their ability like you nicely outlined to, to synchronize to their own rhythms. Um, and so we have probably the most well-established 
uh, metabolic characteristic of, of circadian metabolism is the diurnal, which means across the day, variation in glucose tolerance. And the literature on this goes back experimentally to the 1970s, um, but was particularly um, kind of unequivocally shown to, to, to occur by uh, Eve Van Cotter and her, her research group in Chicago, where they, they had people on a constant glucose infusion across the day. And you could see a progress that the glucose tolerance and, and disposal was enhanced in the early part of the day and the morning was amplified. And over the course of the day, progressively got worse, essentially deteriorated the glucose tolerance. And uh, early research suggested that, well, that probably mirrors insulin. So insulin is enhanced in the early part of the day. Why might that be? And we know that there's a circadian variation in what you mentioned uh, in cretin hormones. So GLP-1 and GIP are these polypeptide um, hormones, which when released, when activated, augment insulin uh, release and, and insulin action. And what that means is that when dietary, when energy intake comes in in the early part of the day, these incretin hormones, their circadian rhythm means they're amplified in, in our biological morning. And what it means is that it, when energy intake is timed according to that, we get this really big, swift insulin response, which is a good thing. Glucose levels come down much quicker. Uh, insulin comes down a lot quicker, even though you've had this big spike and you get this rapid carbohydrate metabolism in the morning. But what's interesting about the mechanistic work is that the decline in glucose tolerance over the course of the day isn't entirely explained by, you know, declining insulin functionality, which, which begged another question, well, well, what else could be going on that explains essentially insulin resistance as, as we go through the afternoon and later in the day? Uh, because the insulin responses were often seen to be the same, give or take after lunch, you know, comparing different. So it was like, well, the insulin response is not explaining the level of glucose intolerance as we get later in the day. So some uh, more recent work then, we're going into the 90s now, looked at the potential relationship between circulating fatty acids, circulating free fatty acids, because they have their own circadian rhythm and it's inverse to that of glucose tolerance. It's inverse to the amplified incretin hormone activity and the augmented amplified insulin response in the early part of the day. And the circadian rhythm in free fatty acids and triglycerides goes the opposite way, right? It generally is suppressed once we have energy intake during the day and it follows a circadian rhythm where it elevates during the biological night. Um, and that's often, again, a period where from a purely biological perspective, not factoring in any externalities like shift work, the body is expected not to have nutrient intake. So we have an increased release. We have increased lipolysis, a breakdown of stored fat. We have increasing circulating free fatty acids at the peak in triglycerides at like give or take by clock time, say like 4 a.m. The peak in free fatty acids is there's kind of two. There's like one at like 11 p.m. and then another at like 2 a.m. kind of thing. So so a group came along actually at the University of Surrey where I'm now based and they said, well, what if there's a relationship between, between elevated free fatty acids and uh, this insulin resistance and impaired glucose tolerance that we see across the day? And that's exactly what they showed. And a number of groups have shown that since. So like I said, insulin didn't explain all of the impaired glucose tolerance in response to later meals and in the evening and, and what filled in the gap in terms of explaining this relationship to an extent was the inverse relationship between circulating fatty acids and insulin resistance, i.e. when circulating fatty acids are high, so is insulin resistance. And this is another reason why uh, morning energy intake may particularly in states of impaired glucose tolerance, like pre-diabetes and type two diabetes. One of the reasons why fasting and skipping breakfast and fasting until lunch, for example, may not be 
an effective strategy for glycemic control in that population is because, because they extend the fast when they wake up, circulating free fatty acids are elevated, but because they don't eat, circulating free fatty acids get higher. And if you have very high circulating free fatty acids before lunch, then that correlates with impaired postprandial insulin and glucose responses to that lunch in, in people with type two diabetes. Uh, it does occur in healthy individuals as well, but the, the magnitude is um, the magnitude uh, is is not as pronounced as it would be in states of impaired glucose tolerance. So, so I think to kind of round that all up, you've got this you've got this master clock, the conductor that really sets the time according to melatonin, and then we've got these peripheral clocks, the the parts of the conductor or, or of the orchestra, and they're optimized in terms of insulin release and action in the morning in cretin hormones follow a circadian rhythm where they're amplified in the morning and that provides an augmentation to the insulin response glucose tolerance is enhanced in the morning both all of these factors the you know um beneficial glucose tolerance in the morning and the progressive impaired glucose tolerance as the day goes on relate to circulating free fatty acids inversely and then there's also now some emerging research, although there's no interventions yet, there's always been mechanistic uh, evidence that shows an inverse relationship between elevated melatonin and an and, and impaired kind of insulin function um, and exaggerated insulin responses in the biological evening. So there's been the suggestion that there's some sort of relationship there. And we have some recent evidence. It hasn't looked at insulin per se, but it has looked at calorie intake in close proximity to the nocturnal rise in melatonin. And the closer that there is great, like a lot of energy distribution in close proximity to an individual's nocturnal rise in melatonin, the higher their body fat. These are cross-sectional studies. So there's, there's some interesting work there that, 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 that you know, needs to be explored in, in an intervention. But what it's suggesting is, again, a relationship between melatonin, the kind of master conductor anchor for our circadian rhythm, and, and potentially some, some of these um, impaired um, aspects of metabolism that we see in, during our biological night. Is there a study or two on melatonin supplementation showing to impair the postprandial glycemic response? Am I making that up? No. So I think, I think that's, is that the Echel? Um, I feel it was like from 2013, maybe. Echel, Echel, um, oh, what's her first, I think she's at Texas A&M. Uh, so, so, so what they did was they looked at like short sleep. Um, yeah. And they had melatonin supplementation. Now, the thing about that is that was like later, if I remember, that was like 5 a.m. or something like that, where they were like curtailed sleep. And yes, melatonin, the administration of melatonin, supplemental melatonin correlated mm -hmm. with, 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 impaired, um, with impaired insulin. Um, now, th there's a bunch of moving parts with that and like, you know, it's supplemental, okay, the timing of it, like, would, would this natural relationship occur just between the fluctuating hormones themselves, uh, you know, at say 9pm, um, that they're, they're the kind of, they're, they're the kind of missing pictures, missing pieces of the puzzle so far. So, um, but yes, we, we have overall very strong diurnal variation, particularly in glucose tolerance and metabolism. Um, and insulin action is enhanced in the early part of the day and is relatively impaired later in the day. Um, and the enhanced insulin action in the morning uh, ties very strongly to the circadian rhythm in GLP-1 and GIP, uh, which augment insulin responses in, 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 in response to morning energy intake. Uh, and all of this may be particularly important for um, states of impaired glucose tolerance like type 2 diabetes um, 
and yeah, and, th and they all relate inversely to circulating free fatty acids. So that's, that's the synopsis, I think. <laughs> yeah, that was an excellent overview. And, and I'm sure many for many of the listeners, the, the gears are turning right now in terms of the implications of this information on the potential benefits to uh, manipulating your energy and macronutri macronutrient distribution to certain times of the day. And, and we will definitely get there, dear listener. But before so, I, I want to I wanna stay on this topic of diurnal variation because there was something specific I came across in your paper that I wasn't familiar with and I thought it was really interesting. And that was uh, the circadian regulation of hedonic appetite. So mm. uh, off the top of my head, I, be I believe one of the primary references here is that we definitely have rodent data showcasing this, right? But do we have anything in humans? Not yet. Not, Not yet. yet. Okay. So that 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 the first couple of sections of the paper very much focused on the neuronal and molecular mechanisms. Uh, the vast majority of which, if not entirely, is in relation to experimental models in in rodents. Um, and it, it goes back a long way. Uh, I mean, th I think the oldest paper cited in the review is from 1922. Uh, where what they what where, where they were looking at animal entrainment to feeding. Now th that that was likely that that could easily be a behavioral adaptation, not necessarily circadian. But essentially, what they would do is they would leave food out at very specific times for a very defined time period, and they would remove it. But they would leave it out at the exact same time every day, and over time, you know, the animals would increase their uh, activity levels in advance of the period of which food was becoming available. So it was showing that they were actually adapting their, their activity levels in the anticipation of this food becoming available. Um, and, you know, that, that research goes way back. But in more recent years, more elegant models that have been looking at knockouts of you know knock out a portion of, of of their brain basically and then see what happens and a lot of circadian genes uh, targets in in various centers of the brain where there's an overlap between energy balance for example uh, at the hypothalamus um there's you know like there's an overlap between leptin and 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 the and at the level of the hypothalamus and some circadian genes and and other aspects of the brain that are involved in um the yeah hedonic and food reward aspects um and you know experimentally yeah you can knock out some of these of these gene targets and mice will just eat themselves to to and, and and the other way around right you can you can you can you can target different areas and and you can see um you know the 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 the, the kind of like they just won't necessarily eat but 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 from the hedonic standpoint yes you can you can target certain pathways circadian pathways that appear to be implicated in the regulation of of hedonic appetite and yeah when you knock these areas out the rodents just uh, go to town on the chow. So it, it's it's interesting. It our our focus um, generally in in the wider chrono and, and sleep fields as it relates to nutrition has looked at sleep curtailment, right? And we know that even just sleep curtailment itself correlates with an increased pre uh, preference for hyperpalatable, energy dense foods, um, and that's always just been hypothesized to be oh, because people are tired, they're self-selecting for like higher energy foods, but maybe there's some more stuff going on and maybe it does relate to some disruption to, to some of these um, circadian uh, pathways that, that, that may, you know, lower uh, or, or sorry, increase um, hedonic food reward um, responses. So, there is some really interesting stuff in those in those animal models. To date, we don't have data in humans because you can't go knocking human genes in the brain out. Maybe they do in China. I'm sure they do. But <laughs> we we have ethics committees here, and uh, 
we're, uh, we're, we're, we're not going to be able to, to, to do that. So we're going to have to think of different experimental ways of, of, um, you know, like if a drug was developed, for example, that like inhibited something, you know, th this kind of thing, then you can test that. But uh, yeah, for, for now, we're, for now, we're, we're, we're confined to these very, very interesting um, animal models, but, but the translational relevance hasn't, hasn't come to pass yet in humans. So there's always that additional part of caution. Um, but insofar as circadian dysregulation skewer um, homeostatic control of food intake, certainly there is a volume of, 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 of as, you, as you read the paper, I mean, it's from the animal models, it's, it's quite a, a, a volume of convincing evidence in that model, but we, we don't have much more to go by. Yeah, and to me it was particularly interesting because it this hedonic appetite seemed to peak in the evening, right? Mm -hmm. Which corresponds with what we see in humans, where it seems that uh, the poor food choices tend to take place in, in the evening. And, and as you mentioned, you know, we don't really know whether this is just lifestyle related. You come home after a long day of work, you just grab the easiest thing. Maybe maybe yeah. you're tired, your ability to make decisions is compromised. So these foods are just really highlighted within your vision to just consume yeah. fairly quickly. Um, but yeah, whether well, whether there is anything more going on there is interesting. Yeah, no, I mean, no, no, no one binge eats in the morning, right? Like the the you know even even you know if we're talking about diagnosed binge eating disorder, I mean it almost exclusively is observed to occur later in the day. So I think there is there's some plausibility to some of 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 some of the the relationships between circadian variation even. Ghrelin, for example, has a kind of circadian rhythm that peaks in the biological evening, um, but that could be influenced by earlier energy intake. So one of the studies we cited there was from Oren Froy and Daniela Jakubowicz group in Israel. They've done a number of uh, different interventions looking at distribution of energy, frequency, all this kind of stuff, comparing breakfast to fasting until lunch in type 2 diabetics and all this kind of stuff. One of their early studies was really interesting because they measured ghrelin and they looked at a high protein, high carbohydrate, high energy breakfast, 700 calories at breakfast, high protein, high carbohydrate, 200 calorie dinner, 600 calorie lunch. And the intervention was 16 weeks. And then they had 16 weeks of follow-up and they measured ghrelin in the follow-up period. And so in the 16 week intervention, you saw this significant weight loss in the high energy breakfast group and a massive suppression of ghrelin in that approach compared to the, the opposite where there was just really no uh, uh, you know, effect on it. And what was the most interesting finding was that when they got to the end of the 16 week follow-up period, 32 weeks into the, the kind of overall study, 16 weeks after the intervention itself has ended, ghrelin was still suppressed in the high energy, high protein breakfast group. So that is potentially one explanation for why high energy, high protein breakfasts may facilitate lower energy intake later in the day. Conversely, low to no energy intake early in the day or skipping meals. It's different for purposeful skipping, you know, people that might do intermittent fasting, but I'm talking about like just your average person in the population with really dysregulated sleeping and eating patterns it just rolls out of bed grabs like a frap and you know doesn't really eat during the day and then comes home in the evening and like you said then you know you're really at a vulnerable place in terms of aligning circadian peaks in 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 circulating hunger uh hormones and and potentially some of this underlying hedonic um mechanisms that that, that we've seen in animal models um and a big challenge with, with, with chrono nutrition research and kind of really anything related to, to circadian biology and human health is separating the behavioral cycle from the circadian cycle, right? Because something that may seem, oh, well, it's circadian because it's happening at this time of day, but it might just be behavioral. It might be nothing to do with, with circadian rhythms. So 
you know, so that that's a really important uh, aspect of study design is, is trying to really be, be quite granular in terms of, are we talking about something that's circadian? Are we talking about something that's behavioral? And, and, any, and, a, and a kind of a way to, to tease that out is if it's behavioral, there'll be an adaption immediately once the behavior changes, right? But if it's circadian, because there's a, a limit to how much the circadian system can shift, you know, if there's no like immediate, if I, if I decide to like suddenly stay up tonight till, till 6 a.m. And, 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 and stay on that schedule for the next two weeks, you know, my, my, my rhythms in glucose metabolism that we just talked about are not gonna just suddenly switch with me. Be like, okay, cool, now, now you're on this time, right? Because they're not behavioral because they're circadian. So they need time to realign. This happens when we get over jet lag. It's perfectly normal for this system to be adaptable, but there's a limit to its flexibility, basically. Um, so yeah, I think, there's some, I think there's some interesting stuff there that could explain some of the eating behavior stuff. And then um, there's, there's some personality correlates. There was a couple of papers that we cited in, in there that you might've seen in relation to like breakfast consumption. There's these like correlates between breakfast consumption, uh, morning type chronotypes of so people who are morning larks. And, but they correlate quite strongly with traits of conscientiousness and agreeableness and these kind of, uh, whereas late evening energy intake and late chronotypes, night owls, correlates more with neuroticism so to what extent there's like a relationship between personality factors breakfast consumption is breakfast as a meal really just a proxy for an individual's time of day preference and personality traits possibly and that was one of the points that i made in the paper that could explain some of the the observational findings about breakfast consumption is um you know the, the, the people who regularly consume breakfast in population studies are likely, you know, more morning types, uh, potentially more health conscious, and it may not necessarily reflect a particular, um, you know, unique benefit to the meal itself. But as a corollary, because most of the breakfast skipping studies tend to relate to diabetes as an outcome, given everything we've seen in intervention studies about like impaired postprandial insulin glucose responses later in the day, particularly exacerbated by breakfast skipping, then, then it's plausible that as people are getting progressively more glucose intolerant on the road to type two diabetes, that that kind of pattern uh, really exacerbates their, uh, their state of progressively impaired glucose tolerance. Hey guys, Mike here. If you're interested in learning more about how to maximize your health, body composition, and performance, head over to hammerawayfitness.com where you can sign up for coaching or even just schedule an hour consult with me to get some of your training and nutrition questions answered. Also, if you enjoyed this episode as much as I did and would like to further support the growth of the Muscle Memoirs podcast, you can give a donation to the link in the show notes leave us a review, and or share this episode with your friends, whether that be dropping the link in a group chat or putting a screenshot in your Instagram story. I truly appreciate it. Yeah, I kind of want to bounce off of your most recent point there and discuss how we do have these correlates in the research about how, oh, breakfast intake, yes, breakfast is the most important meal of the day. And then we also see, oh, evening energy intake when you consume the majority of your calories in the evening we see that it's associated with these adverse health outcomes and most people will, will look at that and they'll just kind of shake a stick at it and be like well it doesn't really matter it all comes down to energy balance at the end of the day maybe the people who are eating later at night they're just consuming more overall energy they're making poorer food choices but it, it does seem to be a little more nuanced than that. And, and there's more to take away from, from this research. And, and as I put in the outline, you know, my, my question more or less is like, where there's smoke, is there fire, right? Like, is it, is it really appropriate to look at this research and say, well, it's observational and it's like, well, it, it's probably due to all these other things, but mm -hmm. we've, are, we've already covered here how there's this diurnal variation. And, and in particular, when it comes to glucose tolerance and how if you consume the same meal at 8 a.m. compared to 8 p.m., we're, we're 
probably going to see a significantly worse postprandial response in 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 the evening. So unravel for the listeners here what we should make of this data, and then maybe we can get into uh, more controlled trials that looked at the differences in energy distribution and mm. how that affected certain outcomes. But what, what do we make of the observational stuff? Yeah, so the, I think there's a couple of take on points in, in the observational stuff. Um, in, 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 in the epidemiology uh, that looks at, you know, temporal eating patterns in humans, timing of food intake across the day, there are consistent, uh, strong associations with increased type 2 diabetes risk with breakfast skipping. Um, there are protective effects observed in certain cohorts like the Seventh-day Adventists, uh, protective effects against increasing body fatness and BMI. And they have a very particular eating pattern as a community where they have their uh, highest energy uh, intake uh, at breakfast uh, and then they have an early lunch. And then they actually have very, they almost do ti early time restricted feed and not quite as, as like six hour window, but they, as a practice as a community tend to have a, a longer overnight fast. Um, and then we've got things like the UCLA energetic study where, you know, they looked at the distribution of energy as it relates to third is like 33% of energy and where did that and you know people consuming over a third of their daily energy intake after 8pm significantly increased risk of uh, obesity and but we do have kind of neutral associations in some of the epidemiology as well and one a couple of things that may explain some of this the recent study in 2019 looked at breakfast intake but stratified by chronotype by an individual's time of day preference and what was really interesting was that they found that breakfast consumption was protective only in morning types so in people who are night owls even high levels of energy in the morning did not were not associated with reduced risk of of, of obesity Conversely, even in night owls, high evening energy intake was still associated with increased obesity. And then we have a couple of cross-sectional studies, like I mentioned at the start, that have looked at body fat as a percentage relative to calorie distribution as it relates to their melatonin timing. So th these were nice, uh, even though they were observational, to do the study, they brought all the participants into a lab overnight to do the, the kind of gold standard measurement of melatonin, which is called dim light melatonin onset. You put them in a dark room, you measure melatonin every hour from 4 p.m. to 8 a.m. the next morning, and you uh, take an average basically, and you, you see where their melatonin levels crossed a certain threshold. And because everyone has slightly different time of day preference, that's generally biological, uh, you know, my, my Dilmo might be 9 p.m., yours could be 11, right? So it can, it's inter individual. And when they normalized that for the average and then looked at calorie intake in proximity to Dilmo, they found that the group consuming their midpoint of calorie intake in close proximity to Dilmo had on average 33% body fat, whereas those consuming it eight hours in advance uh, had an average body fat of like 22%. So the observational studies that are more recent that have factored in the actual chronobiological aspects are suggestive of a relationship between circadian biology and some of the effects that we see at a population level in terms of energy distribution. But the overall weight of data observationally very much supports that later distribution of energy is not associated with positive health outcomes, the, the reverse. It's associated overall direction of effect fairly consistently with increased odds of overweight, obesity, type two diabetes. And one of the potential reasons for that is when energy intake is kind of distributed earlier in the day, it tends to maybe progressively get, there's, there's more meal spacing and there's more time between meals for kind of reduced postprandial responses back to baseline than you eat again. Whereas when eating initiation is delayed, 
and till later in the day, there tends to be less time between meals and an increasing uh, proportion of energy in subsequent meals. So energy intake is getting higher and higher and higher and it's peaking in the evening. And so a majority of daily energy is coming, you know, after 4 p.m. And there's very, uh, there's much less time between these meals. So postprandial metabolism isn't even done from the, from the kind of late two o'clock lunch that someone started eating with, but then they had another meal at five and that was bigger. And then they had another meal at eight and that was bigger. And then they had the lady energy snacks at 10 uh, and then they're going to bed. And all of this is, all of this is in the belly. Um, so that's fairly consistent. And now we have very well conducted intervention studies that would lend some support to why some of these observational effects are observed and they relate to temporal distribution of energy intake across the day um, and, and metabolic health outcomes. Now, Alan, I'm very intrigued by the potential implications of this research on, on the average Joe, which, which in the United States, the average Joe is someone who has an overweight or obese BMI and, and probably has uh, increased risk factors for type two diabetes. But I imagine that, that many of the subscribers to the Muscle Memoirs, people who live a healthy lifestyle might be listening to this and think to themselves, well, the research is very clear and, and consistent, but Alan, I, I lift five days per week. I have above average levels of muscle mass. I, I'm relatively young and generally healthy. Maybe my postprandial glycemic response will be significantly worse in the evening, but like, does it matter really? Does it have any actual implications on my overall health in the long term? So for, for the demographic you're describing, um, I think there's an argument to be made that additional factors like resistance training would, would really, we, we know that resistance training changes your, your metabolic landscape, you know? So if someone's training in the evening and they've just done a hard volume session, you know, that that's, that's a completely different consideration to gen pop, you know, is it, is it still not a great idea to eat 50% of your calorie intake at 11 PM? Probably a good idea to, to not, necessarily do that um but are the considerations the exact same no of course not i mean the glycemic response is going to be attenuated by insulin independent glucose uptake so there's all these factors that are going on there's also you know the actual magnitude of the difference in otherwise healthy people uh even in the evening it, it, it is there but where you would tend to see worse effects is, you know, midnight as a meal versus say 8 p.m. So there's studies that have done that. They've looked 8 a.m., 8 p.m., midnight. And this was at otherwise healthy people. And after the 8 p.m. meal, three hours later, glucose was, was back to baseline. But in the midnight meal, glucose was still elevated before above baseline three hours later. So, you know, it's things like that. It's the time does matter, you know, for people, uh, and this is something me and Danny spoke about a while ago, and we, we, we got a question and we were basically saying that it's still probably a good idea to have a lot of, you know, if you're, if you're someone who trains at 7 PM and you've got, but you've got your total daily energy intake, right? There's no real reason why you still can't have had a lot of that energy leading up to the session and then have, you know, a, a kind of protein rich, uh, almost like a snack meal afterwards, if it was going to be quite late and then sleep on that because you don't need additional carbohydrate for stimulating muscle protein synthesis. You need appropriate amounts of protein and then you could sleep on that and get up and have a, a high energy breakfast the next morning. So, so, but, but generally for the demographic you're describing, it could be splitting hairs. If they do train hard in the evening, you know, then there's, then there's a whole different metabolic landscape that we're talking about. But for the general population, I think there are, there is some real utility to, to these strategies and for people, for your listeners that work with clients, maybe for example, and they've got people who have a pattern of, 
irregular or erratic meal patterns, overeating in the evening, undereating in the morning, you know, central adiposity, you know, a, a level of impaired glucose tolerance that we would infer from the central adiposity and that kind of thing, then, then yeah, I think there's potentially multiple benefits to considering temporal distribution of energy that, that even go beyond just the improved glycemic control and actually extend to things like suppression of ghrelin and appetite regulation like we were talking about. So I think there's additional factors that benefit beyond just the glycemic control in terms of temp temporal distribution in the population, you know, shifting that pattern of energy intake so that they better appetite regulation in the evening, um, better overall postprandial metabolism, better meal spacing, you know, this, the, and, and, and a degree of time restricted feeding, if they do kind of spend every waking minute eating, you know, and are constantly in a fed state, then some application of time restricted feeding, you know, could, could, could be, could be beneficial. And, and why TRF in the free living interventions, the reason that TRF is overall, I mean, there was a big study that came out before Christmas that, that, that found no effect, but it was a quite quite a there was a lot of holes basically in the study so uh the overall direction of effect thus far is still positive even though there's a couple of studies that haven't found much but but the the key point is the why the reason trf is useful for people in the free living interventions is because it's a behavior you're not asking them to eat this diet that diet, eat more of this, less of that, eat this food, don't eat that food, right? That's the stuff, that's all the shit that makes people fail, basically, unless they have a coach. Um, but saying eat within this window that you can self-select and you stop, you start eating now and you stop eating them. That's a behavior and people can engage with behaviors. Um, and so I think there's application for that, at the particularly in populations like the US and the UK that are characterized by up to half of total daily energy coming in the evening. So these are simple modifications to get away from that pattern of energy intake that is, you know, arguably adding up over time based on based on the epidemiology, but based on, you know, as well corroborated by the intervention studies that we have that that show all of these effects. Um, particularly as it relates to kind of carbohydrate metabolism, glucose tolerance, um, impaired postprandial. And then in the evening, you've also got the postprandial lipemia on top of the postprandial <laughs> glycemic response. So, so you know, there's, there's um, a cardiovascular health implication uh, as well. And uh, yeah, so, so I, I think that for, 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 for Joe Public, who fits this demographic of, you know, uh, eating pattern characterized by a much later initiation of, of eating, much later distribution of energy, a, a really long eating window of up to 16 hours of the day. And, you know, all of those kind of factors um, and uh, impaired cardio metabolic uh, health then these are strategies that that become potentially quite useful and the interventions really back that up i love that and i completely agree on the topic of trf when we look at the current body of evidence you know i like to say that the magic of the dietary strategy is that it, it's so simple yet consistently produces pretty pretty reasonable outcomes, outcomes that, that we should care about as practitioners right it, you know just uh, move, move breakfast up hour or two, pull that evening meal pull back meal hour up. or two. Yeah. And, and, you know, we see weight loss improvements and risk factors. And I think people love simple heuristics, right? It's like, mm -hmm. well, keto works for some people. And it's like, why? It's like, just don't eat carbs. And, and you know, sure. and they'll sure. see these reductions in body weight. However, you know, that's a little more difficult to adhere to in the long term than just shortening up this eating window. I, I think those were all uh, really good points for, for the rest of our discussion. I kind of want to just outline a general topic for you and then just 
more or less give your take on it. We, we've done a tremendous job here of outlining the research on the topic, but, but I want to know kind of the, the first thing that comes to mind uh, within the context of all of these factors that we already discussed and the potential benefits of maybe shifting some of that energy distribution to earlier in the day. So on that topic, when we look at trials like the ones from Yukubowitz, which you mm -hmm. mentioned, we have that one by, uh, I'm going to butcher the name, Garowlet, I think it, it was conducted in- Oh, Marta Garowlet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Garowlet, yeah. yeah. Uh, we have, I'm going to butcher this name as well. I can never remember. Is it Bath Bed? Ba Bandine. <laughs> uh, yeah, Which yeah. One? Where they or, saw the, the increased energy experience, the Bath Bed Project. Oh, the, the, bath, the bath, bath Breakfast Project. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. what it is. So yeah. in, in all of these, we, <laughs> we see... For, for listeners, Bath is a town in England, not the thing you get into full of water. <laughs> <laughs> that See, that that's, that's going to help me remember that study name now too. Yeah. But we, we see, you know, improved postprandial outcomes. We see improved weight loss effectiveness. We see uh, increased dietary induced thermogenesis from shifting calories to earlier in the day. We see some uh, increases in activity thermogenesis. There, there are a lot of potential positives here, but, but when you look at the literature and you consider the implications of the average Joe uh, distributing more of their calories to earlier in the day, what do you think is the potential primary benefit with all of these things in mind? Do you think it's the postprandial improvements? Do you think yeah, it's- yeah. Oh, you do? Yeah, I do. I, I think I think the the primary benefit is is postprandial glucose metabolism. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And 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 as a result, lower daily twenty four hour glucose levels, lower subsequent when you have the kind of high energy breakfast. We know that the postprandial glucose response to dinner, to lunch, and dinner is lower than if you'd skip breakfast. Um, it means that the overall insulin profile over the day is, is much, is much healthier and, and lower. Um, and that to me is, is certainly the, the, the kind of standout benefit from a metabolic health perspective. Uh, and as I said, at the start, it, the magnitude of that benefit gets greater as someone's metabolic health is, is, is lower, is deteriorated more. Uh, and so, yeah, you can see differences in otherwise healthy individuals but the, the, the real uh, huge benefit is, is generally observed in participants with type two diabetes. Excellent. Now, now this next one, a uh, very, very nuanced topic, uh, one people like to argue about a little bit, and that is meal frequency. So when I look at the research on meal frequency, I think it's similar to what we talked about prior to going live, and that's the relationship between egg consumption and, and cardiovascular disease risk. It's like, you know, this paper comes out and it's like, like you're eating a, an egg every day. What are you interested in death? Like, that's ridiculous. <laughs> and, then, and then another paper comes out and it's like, you can eat a carton every day and like, you're probably fine. Like yeah. when we look at meal frequency, it's like, you should eat six meals per day and that's going to improve appetite control, uh, augment weight loss outcomes. And, and then another paper will come out and it'll be like, you should probably eat like twice at most, maybe three, if, if mm -hmm. you're particularly ravenous that day. When, when you look at the literature, obviously there's all of these factors to consider, right? So it's like, if you're eating six compared to three times per day, like what's the composition of those meals, you know, is six feedings, three squared meals and like three gummy bear snack sessions or, you know, there, there's a lot to consider, but if someone were to ask you, you know, when they look at their meal frequency and based on their lifestyle and everything else, they're like, I I'm fine with whatever. I could eat twice a day. I could eat six a day. But like, what do you think about the literature as it stands? If I want to potentially improve my appetite control, uh, make it easier to get into a calorie deficit, does the literature seem to point one way or the other? Yeah, so I, I, I think for me, this is similar to the kind of breakfast question where it's like, you know, if it, it, it depends on the outcome that we're talking about. If we're talking about weight loss, mm -hmm. just general weight loss, you know, uh, is there any advantage to breakfast? No, like not really. Uh, is there any advantage to a higher versus lower meal frequency for weight loss? Or does it increase your energy expenditure? No. And because the answers to those two questions are no, the baby has tended to get thrown out with the bath washer, particularly within the fitness industry. It's like meal timing's dead. It doesn't, it's just like, well, 
what are we talking about? Are we talking about weight loss? Yeah, fine. But, you know, nothing really matters for weight loss other than, <laughs> other than an energy deficit. Sure, we can make that point. We can be really nihilistic and say nothing, nothing's relevant. But from the perspective, again, of postprandial metabolism, and particularly in participants with type 2 diabetes, that, 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 that is not the case. I mean, we, we've a number of well-conducted interventions showing that despite the kind of generic advice for diabetes management being the kind of little and often equal distribution across the day of ca calories and carbohydrates, uh, you know, that, that really does not appear to be an optimal strategy for, for glucose metabolism. And a combination of lower meal frequency and or front-loaded energy intake, as we've discussed in the context of lower meal frequency, are factors that have been shown to significantly reduce total postprandial glucose excursions, your total whole day exposure to elevated glucose, time spent in a hyperglycemic state, um, and various you know uh, outcomes, obviously of, of relevant to diabetes management. So. I would say that from the perspective of weight loss, no meal frequency doesn't matter. Eat one, eat twenty. I mean, you know that th those extremes are a bit. <laughs> all right, I'm, I'm being a bit. I'm being a bit of a sophist. So, you know, the, the extremes are probably not optimal. But yeah, like the, the studies comparing like three to six and stuff. No, but if we're talking about metabolic health and we're talking about again people more representative of of, of the average person in the in the U.S. or U.K. population that you know is more sedentary and central adiposity and you know impaired glucose tolerance and and kind of on that on that road to adverse cardiometabolic health over time then i think a, a case can can be made that postprandial metabolism is something that is better served with a, a a kind of lower meal frequency of say you know your your three square so to speak <laughs> to go a bit old school and military on it but it does appear because even I, I know we've spoken a lot about glucose tolerance and glycemic control and insulin and diabetes management, but you know cardiovascular disease. Uh, like back in God, it's it's the late seventies. A paper by Zilverschmidt first described cardiovascular disease as what they called a, a postprandial phenomenon. Um, you know, and 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 that is the reality of of the underlying mechanisms that influence like protein metabolism and you know, circulating VLDL, LDL, triglycerides, all that kind of stuff, that, that's all postprandial metabolism. Um, and so, you know, the idea of, of a, a more regulated meal frequency, and again, one that's optimized more for, for, for the timing of that energy intake in line with our more efficient um, metabolic function during the day, is such where we're, we're really minimizing or, tr or attempting to, to kind of minimize the number and, and extent and magnitude of postprandial excursions for, for you know, lipids and, and, and glucose and all that, all that stuff that can get, get sticky. <laughs> yeah, agreed. I, I would say my interpretation of the literature tends to lean that way as well when it comes to people uh, with type 2 diabetes and increased risk. It, it doesn't seem that that conventional strategy of, you know, eating around the clock, six meals per day, you yeah. know, bolus of carbohydrates. Base, base your diet on starchy foods. I'm like, I, 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 I really scratch my head when I still see generic diabetes guidelines um, that are that are basically telling people to eat the you know, the, 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 well, you call it the, my plate, we call it the eat well guide. You know, it's just like, didn't, didn't no one <laughs> update this, <laughs> but yeah. yeah, there we have it. Yeah. <laughs> I had on uh, Hannah Kaliova kind of to discuss that myth, you know, and, and showcasing her research, uh, her, her original study on early time restricted feeding before it was cool. Right. Where we had the breakfast and lunch and we saw these significant improvements in, in this population. Yeah. So she she did she did some nice research in this area. She did one of the Seventh Day Adventist cohort studies mm -hmm. looking at meal frequency. Uh, she also did a number of these interventions in type two diabetes, comparing two meals versus the the generic kind of six meal 
calories spaced throughout the day and, and again showed quite a significant benefit to the reduced meal frequency in terms of postprandial glycemic control and to overall 24 hour glycemic control. So yeah, I think I think there's I think there's merit to this. Um, and, and there's I think it's important to say that like there's flexibility within this within this kind of paradigm that we're talking about because you know the idea that it's, it has to be front loaded to the first meal is not even necessarily correct because the Mediterranean eating pattern, for example, is, is not that it's a kind of, you know, low to moderate energy breakfast with the peak of energy intake actually in the middle of the day at lunch. Um, so, and that's the dietary pattern associated with, with positive health outcomes even within the Mediterranean region, we get some really interesting insight into this because if you go to Spain where they have this like natural tendency to like delay energy intake and you compare groups consuming their, their big main meal earlier in the day versus later in the afternoon, well, we see beneficial outcomes in the earlier group. We've seen that both Marta Garley's secondary analysis of the intervention and also her research group then did an intervention based on that observation in lean, healthy young women, where lunch and uh, sorry, breakfast and dinner were the exact same time, and both diets matched for energy. Uh, breakfast at eight uh, a.m., dinner at eight p.m., and all they did was change the timing of the lunch one one p.m. versus four thirty p.m. And in the late lunch group, again, their their postprandial glucose was like forty six percent higher. So again, lean, healthy, otherwise. You know, none of, none of this cardiometabolic risk that we see in other studies, and um, we still see we still see that effect. So, yeah, I mean, this 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 stuff is there. I mean, I, the the tendency to dismiss there is a lot of pushback with chrononutrition. People are like, it's not relevant. It's 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 an extra layer for people to have to stress about. So we shouldn't be majoring in the minors. And I'm like, most people are just majoring in the minors. The, 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 the reason this is accessible is because it's a behavior-based approach. It's, it's getting people away from majoring in the minors and, 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 and worrying about minutiae and getting them focusing on big picture stuff uh, that can have an impact in the absence of calorie counting. And I think that's a really important factor uh, that we can sometimes get a bit lost about when we you know, get roped into conversations about calorie deficits and well, if people just did this, that and the other. And it's like, yeah, but like you're talking about 1% or less of the actual population that can seem like it's 90% when you're on Instagram, but like it's just not. So we need strategies for people that don't have them buried in an app because no one's got time for that shit like for the most part <laughs> in the real world. So we need strategies for people, like you said, okay, let's, and that was Rona and Tony's research, like, at, you know, in, in, in Surrey. Uh, so delay breakfast by 90 minutes, bring dinner forward by 90 minutes. You self-select your window. Okay, cool. We can do that. Um, you know, loss of subcutaneous adipose tissue, abdominal fat, all this kind of stuff. Great. Cool. Now you're improving cardiometabolic risk with a simple behavior that's accessible for people. So yeah, I think I think some of the pushback I find sometimes kind of straw mans the actual literature, um, or it gets it gets kind of you know a bit a bit you know kind of um, carried away with over extrapolating uh, findings from just weight loss research. I'm like, yeah, but like, I've never made an art. And I went, I really, with the paper, with the review, wanted to make the point that there's probably nothing special about uh, breakfast or these temporal distribution factors if we're just talking about weight loss. But that's just not the be all and end all. It's not the only outcome that matters. And many of these interventions are observing these effects independent of weight loss, which is something that we should always pay attention to, I think. Absolutely. I, I, I couldn't agree more there. Last thing I have for you, Alan, we are 
wrapping up this talk, and so far we've connected a lot of dots when it comes to this chrononutrition research. So my question is for you is, what are you most interested in seeing? Like, what questions do you still have that you feel need to be answered? <laughs> when I consider this research as a whole, I, I think the chronotype Thing, yeah. whether whether that has a major effect on these outcomes is interesting I, i'd like to see uh, a little more research on early time restricted feeding we we had that bomb dropped by sutton and then these follow-ups which are are much smaller mm -hmm. uh you know the the paper by hutchinson and, and mm -hmm. ravison interesting but we definitely need more there uh but i i remain skeptical because even though you know it, it seems like this would be the ticket in this area early time restricted feeding right I, i'll never i'll never forget in my conversation with Dr. Nicola Guest, she said, you know, it, it's interesting, but to be completely honest, I've worked with a lot of clients. I've utilized a tremendous amount of different interventions. I've never had a client strictly adhere to early time restricted feeding for an extended period of time. And I was like, oh, well, <laughs> maybe, maybe it's not the ticket that if no one no, can adhere to it. I, I, I just don't think it's, I don't think it's feasible. Um, I don't think eater, I, I just don't think stop stopping eating uh, at 1 p.m. or 2 p.m. Is, is feasible for people, unless the only caveat is if you really sell it as it's for six weeks, right? Someone with impaired glucose tolerance, pre-diabetes, and you're saying this is for six weeks or eight weeks, right? Like if someone can do the VLCD and drink liquid 800 calories for eight weeks, they can do ETRF for, for eight weeks. But I appreciate Nicola clinically, you know, is, is working with much much, much longer term, uh, you know, kind of, you mm -hmm. know, management and stuff. And, and actually I'm, I must catch up with her in the coming weeks. So um, the areas, oh God, uh, what gas, so many gaps that need to be filled. It's, an, it's a new field, you know, like yeah. relatively in terms of human research. So um, there's, 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 there, okay. There, there's one that I think is going to be interesting. We, we, we have a paper, um, the, our, our, our postdoc on, the, on the, the grant that we've been working on over the last couple of years came up with this brilliant way of considering based on previous research um, what the underlying circadian variation, diurnal variation in your resting metabolic rate was and it correlates to core body temperature. So it's lowest in the morning when your core body temperature is low and it peaks in the afternoon or at 5 p.m. give or take. And all of these studies that find this big difference in TEF and thermic effective feeding, none of them account for that. And so she put together this kind of model based on this curve, basically mathematical curve where kind of mapped out using our own data, a circadian, using data from a previous group who had quantified circadian RMR over the day. And then using our energy expenditure data from our controlled lab study. And then once adjusted for circadian RMR, there was no, the, the TEF difference is, was abolished basically. So there, we don't think that there's any difference in TEF at all between any meal across the day. We think that what is being shown is a, essentially a mathematical error um, because of the way that TEF is calculated and not factoring in underlying circadian armor. So this is just, this is a kind of methods paper. Um, and I think, uh, I don't know, I think that we're, there's, there's a conversation amongst the, amongst the profs about where to send it. So we'll see where it winds up, but I will let you know. So, so I think that would be interesting to see kind of tested specifically. This is kind of secondary analysis of our, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a hypothesis essentially. I, I really like to see an intervention looking at calorie distribution relative to DILMO, relative to melatonin. Uh, I think some of those cross-sectional studies are really interesting. They might explain some of the kind of adverse metabolic outcomes and why there's maybe a difference between an individual's chronotype. And as you said, then the, the chronotype factor, does that explain the relationship between meal timing in and of itself? Um, and how does that relate to Obviously, chronotype, late chronotypes would have a different timing of Dilmo. It would be later. You know, does that relate? If, if, you're, if I'm a late chronotype and I'm eating uh, dinner at 8 p.m., is, is, you know, is that okay? Is that, whereas if I'm an early chronotype and I have Dilmo at 9 p.m. and I'm eating at 8 p.m., is that those kind of interventions, I think, need to be done 
to give us more of a, an understanding of this relationship. And then I think the temporal distribution, I think, you know, the, the Daniela Yakubovic studies are fantastic, but they don't control for diet entirely. So the diet's prescribed. And I, my, based on their ghrelin study, I think everyone just goes away, eats a really high energy, high protein breakfast, and then just isn't hungry for the rest of the day. So their calorie intake drops, they lose weight. So uh, the University of Aberdeen will be, will be, which was part of our grant, they, they did a kind of an intervention study looking at this, but they prepared every single meal in their metabolic kitchen um, and participants who were all local came and collected all the meals. So they, 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 they all of all of the diet. Now, could they have not eaten everything yet? But look, this is this is short of locking people in the lab. This is as good a dietary control as you will get in a nutrition intervention. So, I the findings of, of that will be interesting, particularly for the kind of glucose, you know, factors metabolism that we were talking about. But yeah, I think so. The relationship between melatonin, chronotype, evening distribution. Um, and, and broadly speaking, the kind of relationship between chronotype and meal timing, I think, I think they're all the things that are probably, um, for me, the most interesting areas of this. And I think they're really where some well-conducted interventions are required right now, because there's lots of good interventions in relation to other things like breakfast versus no breakfast, blood glucose is an outcome, all this kind of stuff. I think the interventions now should would be really good if they looked at, at these kind of these kind of factors. It's a very exciting field of research. I, I'm yeah. looking forward to seeing some of the outcomes that that you mentioned there. But Alan, that that's all I have for you today. You've been very generous with your time. I really appreciate it. This has been a lovely discussion for, for the listeners who want to go learn more about you and support you. Where can we point them towards? Uh, so my, my kind of lone social media outlet is on Instagram at the nutritional underscore advocate. Um, you can read some of the articles that I write and listen to the podcast that uh, I am blessed to record with Danny Lennon with Sigma Nutrition. And you can also find my own website, which is alineanutrition.com. And that's uh, a kind of research review based platform where we have a new review of a study coming out every Friday. So uh, yeah, they're the, they're the three main locations. Do you want to plug your study you're working on? We got some listeners overseas. Oh yeah, I, I guess. Yeah, that, that would be great. I mean, yeah. So for anyone interested, I'm currently uh, recruiting. It's an ongoing recruitment. I've got people running through the study right now. We're looking at the relationship between chronotype, personality traits, and meal timing. Uh, we basically get you to fill out some very simple baseline questionnaires, download an app, and then use the app to photograph the meals and snacks you have for two weeks. And when you take a photograph, it timestamps the meal. So we know it happened at 10.06 a.m. or whatever. And uh, it's really easy. It exports into a PDF. You email it to me and then, and then we have that data. So it's purely observational. There's no lab visits. You can do it from wherever you work, live or otherwise. And yeah, if you're, if you're in the UK um, and interested in that kind of study, then please, uh, yeah, just reach out to me. Sign up, everyone. If you're listening to this, you probably already track your intake. <laughs> Yeah, if Alan, you're already doing <laughs> If Alan was taking subjects from the US, you, you know I would be in it. But so all the overseas <sighs> listeners, get in there, uh, do it for science. We, we would really appreciate it. But everyone, that does it for another episode of the Muscle Memoirs podcast. Thank you so much for listening.